I'm walking down the street. I do want to say to Donnie and many of you in this room that over a very long career in this city, all of you have helped me and my colleagues tell the truth and to try to tell. What does this event mean to you, Miss Peggy Mars? Oh, my heart. Happy 20th anniversary. My heart is about loving up on my sister. Do you know what it feels like to have your sisters in the room? John. Just what you see in the flesh. I'm free from people, free from myself. There's the doctor lives next door to the janitor, the janitor to the, to the reverend and the lawyer. We were together. Now we get so high and mighty that you create stress on your society because you don't like poor black folks either. That's a health problem. Get yourself together so I can stop being taking care of geriatric people. <laughs> First name's Donnie, last name's Glover, ended the winning for the long haul, baby! And I just love the ending to that song. Uh, pretty upbeat and motivating, pretty much like today's guest, Mr. Ryan C. Green, media executive, visual storyteller, and leadership trainer, whether via a stage in front of thousands, over the radio, on television airwaves, or through one of his 10 best-selling books, this passionpreneur, that you never heard that before, this passionpreneur, Ryan C. Green, is the go-to producer for leaders, speakers, and authors looking to master, magnify, and monetize. Oh, look at that alliteration there, Ryan. Master, magnify, and monetize their signature message through visual media. We have the founder of Greenhouse Media, Ryan C. Green. Good morning, my friend. How are you? What's going on, Don? It's been a while. Good to see you, man. It's been a minute. As the founder of Greenhouse Media, Ryan specializes in producing and directing premium quality, impactful, and entertaining visual media platforms for those looking to grow their impact, influence, and income. You really big on alliteration, huh? Through their story and brand. Born to be dope. What is born to be dope? Man, let's listen. First of all, I'm so glad to be here when you call. I'm like, yeah, let me take it back to the roots, man, with Donnie. So I'm glad to be here. Born to be dope, man. It's really a celebration of being unapologetically great at being you. So uh, I mean, my journey I started, my, my public journey started about 18 years ago as a writer and a speaker. And just through that journey, really trying to find my course and really find my purpose and walk in it you know you, you you have your highs and your lows and after the pandemic after things started to really um kind of peak like they were going to be open i was like okay so so what what's going on now what am i now what am i going to take to the world and what is what is the world showing me and a lot of people were stuck with trying to figure out who are they after the you know things shut down after jobs were taken away after money was lost after all the things they thought was important to them and made them and validated them were gone it's like well well what's left who am i what have i been doing this for and it was just a doc it was it was a declaration man that you know we were born to be dope and just showing up being ourselves i think that so many times we fall into the trap of trying to compare ourselves to other people trying to look like this person do it like this person and you know what? We're dope just being us, unapologetically. You know about that word because I know it's the name of one of your books, man. So uh, that's what it was, just being about, you know, taking it back to the hip hop because I wanted to combine hip hop and personal development, you know, and because I'm part of the hip hop culture and generation. I've been uh, alive as long as hip hop has been around. Uh, so just really um, 
taking it back to just being dope, man. Hip hop was about being you. Um, and just, hey, here I am, accept me as I am and, and do with it as you will. But this is, I'm not changing uh, who I am to make somebody else happy. So I know that was a long answer, man, but that's what Born to Be Dope is all about. So, you know, when I think of you, Ryan, I think of the king of reinvention. Would you, yeah. would you say the pandemic put you, me, others in... It's kind of like putting us on the foul line. You gonna hit the foul shot or not? Yeah. Did, did you did you have to reinvent yourself? I mean, that's where the streaming stuff started for us. December yeah. twenty twenty, I couldn't interview. Everything had changed. Yeah, and and I had been wanting to learn how to stream. And this one mentee of mine, he was kind of like giving it to me, then he take it back, give me a little bit. I'm like, man, show me how to damn stream. Right, right. And then it was a lady. And so often is the case, it was a sister, Peggy Mars, who brought me on her show, showed me this thing right here, StreamYard, and the rest was history. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that... Me the door, you know, once you give me daylight, it's over. It's going to be like... It. It's going to be like Odell on the, on the wide open field. It's ball game. You're not catching yeah. And, and I think that that attitude right there is what pre-pandemic scared so many people from trying to help other people. Right. Oh, no. Because if I get this to Donnie, be, bro, we I think that uh, we 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 have too, too many people have a scarcity mindset. I don't come like that. I'm an abundant mindset. I think if, the more I can help others, the better it is for everybody else. I don't think the majority of people think like that, though. And I think they have a scarcity mindset. So they're afraid to tell you their trade secrets. Right. So I think that the pandemic forced a lot of people to, OK, I, 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 was, I had to slow down now. Like I have time now. I can go and learn that that thing I was I was waiting on independent somebody else to teach me. So for me, the pandemic was a reinvention because this was all still part of my my long term plan. But what it did was it accelerated and refocused my actions. Uh, but definitely, you know, reinvention and, and that that born to be dope part. I, I call it the remix. I actually, have a whole event called the remix. It's like the very thing you're talking about is just now that we're here. How's the the second half of my life? You know, the, the part two um, after post pandemic. You know, uh, going to look for me. I'm going to go back to doing the same old things I was trying to do that I knew didn't make me happy. Or am I going to go ahead and reinvent myself, remix myself and really tap into what makes me excited, what makes me dope and use that to, uh, you know, take to the world and, 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 and do whatever, you know, it may be. So I think that that's what really when you look at the positive side, obviously the negative side, you know, we we, we understand what happened, the negative side and all people that we lost. Um, but for those who who. Uh, were were focused on how to benefit and, and take advantage of this forced slowdown in our lives. I think that you know, then look at yourself. You're streaming now. You, you, you you're international now <laughs> because anybody can see this show from anywhere in the world. You're not uh, beholden to uh, you know. I don't, I don't want to say the, the network, but you're not beholden to them telling you what you can and cannot say, who you can and cannot bring on stuff like that. Now you're in control, and, and because you were forced to slow down and, and learn it. And, and I think that's 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 uh, a great thing. A lady told me that no, it was a young kid. It was a young kid who said I heard him on the radio or television. He said COVID was God's way of sending everybody to their room. <laughs> the young kid said that. Yeah, yeah. I can relate. I like that. He put everybody on punishment. I like that. <laughs> Go sit down for a while. Don't come out to their room. Yeah. And, and what are you going to do? What are you mm -hmm. going to do now? Uh, mm -hmm. The question came to me last night. What is God's will for my life? I've always felt this calling toward media mm -hmm. as, as a little kid. Speaking of which, tell me about your growing up. All right. Absolutely. You know, I, I typically, you know, I grew up in the mean streets of Baltimore, you know, all right, I'm lying. I'm lying. I grew up in the County. I grew up, I can't, I can't front on you cause you're from the mean streets. I grew up in the County. So, I mean, there was streets in my neighborhood, but I didn't grow up on the streets. I was like, let me tell you something. Y'all had Hillcrest out there in Baltimore County. I don't know if you remember Hillcrest. Bro, Hillcrest I live like 
like the Murphy homes of, of I lived in the townhouses next to Hillcrest. The the uh, fence hey, from hey. Hillcrest was my townhouses. So so no, I was joking about the city, but no, it, it wasn't like it was all Gucci where we were. But no, yeah, I lived you next to You had to, to watch Hillcrest. your back. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. You know, you couldn't go up in Hillcrest by yourself. Yeah, you somebody had to walk you in to Hillcrest. Yes. You know, so absolutely. But uh, you know, I just came a single mom, you know, um, <laughs> grew up. But in high school, I was always start there because in high school, I look back at my high school memory book, and the question in there was, What do you want to be when you grow up? And um, I, I didn't remember this because I started looking back as an adult. It said well, I want to be an entrepreneur. Milford. Uh Milford. Milford. Yeah, I went to Milford. Yeah, I was well, right there on that line. Probably knew my know my nephew, Robert Wells. The name doesn't sound familiar. Okay, but that okay. mean, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I was uh, class of 93, so I'm not sure. When he yeah, well, he's, like, he's a little bit older than you. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, but that was it. I, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur um, all my life. Like, I just knew I wanted to be a business owner, but I didn't necessarily know what kind of business. So, um, as, where, where did that come from? You, I don't know, man. I don't know. It was just, oh, I, actually, you know what? I think I, I do. Because my mom worked, my mom and dad both worked for the government all their lives. And I just knew that uh, at that time, I didn't want to put my time into a, I was always business minded. I, I just never wanted someone else telling me how to live my life. Um, but then I also didn't want to work 10, 15 years for a company. And then they tell me, oh, well, you know what? We're laying you off. I just never wanted to feel that. I, I take seen that. With me. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that was just always me. I never wanted that. Now, being, you know, growing up now, it's like, okay, there's a whole lot of benefits to work in corporate America. But that was just my, my course was not to, fall with someone else like not to uh be under someone else who had that much control over my life so uh you know my grandmother was an entrepreneur i didn't real you know like, growing up you see that my grandmother had a beauty salon on uh pennsylvania avenue um uh, margaret's gateway to beauty so uh, right there what pennsylvania it was, Stanford? i don't know the, the cross street but you know where the library is uh, pennsylvania and north that library a you, couple blocks down. Library still there? Yeah. Huh? Yes. So, so if you go further into the city, like two, three blocks down, I can send you a picture after the show. I think where it's it Stanford Place, right there on the corner. It was. It might. It was a. Uh, what was Stanford Place? Was that a? Is that no, a lounge San, or Stanford? Like Stanford and Stanford. Stanford. Oh, 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 oh. I don't know. I it, it, was, it, was, it was one a one block street. Yeah, I'm gonna send you a picture so you can see exactly where she was because it was on Pennsylvania, but um, you know. So this I guess it was kind of Pennsylvania Avenue. So yeah. so, so I don't know grandma, where the cross were. I was your, I was a kid. But your grandma had to have known some of the legends. You know, I live here on Carrollton Avenue, which is like a block over from Fremont. And mm -hmm. I've been told stories by older cats of when uh Red Fox, other entertainers, wow, they couldn't stay in the hotels. Uh-huh. So they stayed in these houses. People rented wow. rooms. People gave them place, a place That's to that. stay when they came to this part of the world. You know, seg yeah. you know, Baltimore is the home of segregation. Yeah, of course, of course. Yep. I even, yeah. I'll even tell you in my, uh, I guess I write about him in this book. A man named Tom Smith, okay. and he owned the Smith Hotel. He was the largest black hotelier in the United States, straight out of Baltimore. Wow. And he lived, now this is pre-segregation. He lived in the 6600 block of Rice's Town Road. Oh, wow. All of that to say that there's so much black history, rich black history, that mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. decimates the foolishness these fools give us and, and teach our children. That's why we got to but your grandma was in great company. She had to know a little Willie. Hey, I, I wish she was still here for me to ask her. I, mean, I was so young that, you know, you just living. You don't understand. So it was like when I was older and looked back, like, oh, my grandmother owned a salon on Pennsylvania Avenue. And I know the she history of Pennsylvania gangster. Avenue. Your yeah. grandma was gangster, man. <laughs> I don't know. She might hey, she might have been. She, I don't know. Maybe she kept that part from me. But, yeah, she was. So that it was, I guess, it's Emmy, you know? But uh, that, that's kind of where it started. And it was always when I went to uh, when I got to college, I thought I was going to be a singer. I was going to start a uh, I started a music group. We were going to be uh, the next boys to men. So I started songwriting. Uh, spoiler alert. That didn't happen. So 
I thought I was going to be a music producer too, gospel music. Yeah. yeah and then so something like, hit me and said, uh, you're going to need something a little more tangible, bud. Yeah, exactly. Boys I, man, I, huh? I could write, but I couldn't sing, couldn't play instruments, you know, so it was like, you don't have to talk. I could write. But after that, you know, so I was like, oh, maybe I'll go and be babyface. And I'll just start writing music and songs for people. Uh, but like you said, but then you saw you need some money. Right. So <laughs> it was just a matter of um, working. And once I started working, I, and it, it just never went away. It was always there. That entrepreneur, if, you're, if you're an entrepreneur, that, that bug doesn't go away. You're always looking for how can I do something more? How can I do something to to get my freedom? Because my thing was all about. Uh, not to you know i didn't become an entrepreneur because i wanted to be rich i mean i want to make money obviously but i want to freedom of my time i want to control my time and where i go i i i don't understand how people can be happy with asking somebody can, excuse me the boss can i go pp please can i go to the bathroom <laughs> you know like that's just not how i was made so you know that that's just how my journey started while i became an entrepreneur i heard you mention something about a pen you said a pen? Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. You said you were writing. Yeah. When did this writing thing start? Because you know, this 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 is your vehicle. Yeah, yeah. I think and, I hear yeah. you say it was this your first vehicle? It was well, as it was. an entrepreneur, your first tool. Yep. I mean, it's my tool now. It's my tool now. And, and it's funny because I actually talk about this like um. You know, the older we get, the more we start looking back and really trying to craft our story and figure out how did I get here, right? And I tell people, your purpose, if you really look back at your life, your purpose has been there the whole time, right? 1971, like I, I was writing a love letter. Bro, I was in, in, in I, 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 when I was in school, you know, we had, to, we had to pass functional tests, right? You had to pass your math test, reading test. We had a writing test. I don't know if they still make them pass all these tests. But in ninth grade, we had a writing test. And I scored a perfect score on the writing test. Um, now, I think it was like maybe, yeah, I don't know who else, but I scored a perfect score on the writing test. Now, here's the thing, right? So clearly I was a gifted writer. But what they did uh, in school was like, okay, we've got this smart black boy who can write. We're going to put him in gifted and talented English in 10th grade. Now, I know gifted and talented English now is just where they put the 30 best behaved kids, right? But back then, you had to be gifted or talented to be gifted and talented. So it was six kids in my English class, man. And, uh, and of course, being six kids in a class now, I'm like, okay, people looking at me like I'm the nerd. So <laughs> I did everything. You about I, that? Back then? Yeah. Nobody, I wanted to be cool, Donnie. I, I now no now I'm realizing okay yeah being a nerd is cool I was like but I wanted to be cool I want to be seen as cool with my friends I ain't with them talking about me because I ain't had the fly clothes we ain't have a lot of money I was like listen I, I'm trying I played on the football team I was the captain of the football team uh How that, love, that alone should get you props it should we weren't really that good though so <laughs> <laughs> we weren't really that good so that didn't give me that many props. So I was like, listen, you know, I saw this, like I'm in this, this gifted in English class and uh, I spent the next two years trying to fail out on purpose. Like I was, I failed. Ten oh no. Just, just so I could be put back in honors English class with my friends. So they could see me as, as one of them. Is what? The my 12th my grade. They finally took me out. Like, all right, fine. We can't keep you in these honor, this gifted classes with these grades. So we put you back in honors. Got the honors class. Guess what, Donnie? I was still a cornball to them students, to my classmates. I was still a nerd. I was still a cornball. But now I had D's and E's in my report card. So, yeah. Had I known better, I would have done better. That's so I... fascinating. Ryan, I yep. went to Lamel. Wow. When we had, we had You had to put them up every day. Yeah. So I didn't mm -hmm. care what anybody thought because it didn't matter. At the end of the day, you still got to fight. Yeah, yeah. I remember at Lamel people bragging about how many deficiencies they got mid, you know, midterm. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And and I briefly had that thought. I wish I'll take up defi my father was an undertaker, Ryan. Don't oh, you bring wow. in those deficiencies, man? Yeah. That wasn't even a thought. No. Nah, but you did nah. have to fight every day. Yeah, we weren't we weren't fighting. That was that was at least I wasn't fighting. But um, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, my parents were not happy about it. You know, um, did you tell like, them you know, why? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. I told him why. I told him I didn't want to be in the class. I don't know if I told him so so much about the whole social aspect, not being a nerd. I don't know if I'm. I don't remember if I went that deep into it, but I definitely told him I didn't like the classes. But they and, knew. You know, they had to know you're yeah. that kid. So I would, you know, I would turn. You know, the and and the tenth grade year wasn't as bad as eleventh grade. Eleventh grade year, that teacher she just didn't even like me. Period. So we were just going back and forth the whole time. So then it became more about okay, this this this, this white lady trying to tell me who I am and all this kind of stuff. So. You know, and then um, there's I, that. Yeah, so that was people always look. If I could do anything different, I wouldn't change that in my life. Nah, that's stupid. Yeah, there's some things I would change. Like I would have definitely, <laughs> you know, taken advantage of that opportunity. But I think my point in all that was it was never. Had people then shared and said, "Hey, look, Ryan, we see a gift in you as a writer." Going back to the whole pen thing, here's how we want to help develop it. Then I'm like, okay, now I can see the plan. I can see the vision. Show me, and, and I'm. Take me there, you know, show me what I can do with this. But it wasn't that. It was just like, okay, here, you're in this class all of a sudden. And, you know, at, at, what was that, 15 years old, the most important thing to me was being, you know, having friends, being, you know, having a friend circle, not thinking about, um, you know, where this could take me the rest of my life. So, yeah, writing has always been there. So as a writer in high school, like I said, you know, as a songwriter, and then my career took me as an author and a speaker. Uh, it's just always been there. I just didn't always recognize that as the thing. Like I didn't realize that that was the foundation, the core that was going to, you know, dictate, determine everything I did for the rest of my life. When did you start venturing out of, you know, Liberty Road Corridor, Ramstown? <laughs> when I went to college, by the time I went to college, when I went to high, I went to uh, Hampton University for college. That was the first time I've been out of Baltimore. And that really changed my life because, um, yeah. you know, going out, like leaving the city, you realize we're, first of all, you're around people from all across the country and the world. So you realize, and that's why I try to stress to people in Baltimore all the time, get out. You don't have to stay out. But especially young black out, men. Especially, especially our young black men. Get out of the city. Ex explore the world, explore the, uh, uh, um, people act like DC is, is three countries another, away. Like <laughs> another planet. <laughs> right. So it was like, just go somewhere else, see how people live, uh, learn something different. So for me, it was college. Like those four years I spent down in Hampton, Virginia, which was, was much slower than uh, Baltimore, but it, it allowed me to just cultivate uh, me and really figure out who I was and who I wanted to become and then bring that back. So, um, you know, Liberty Road, that corridor, like Liberty Road and uh, Roland, that, that's, you know, like I said, Hillcrest, that whole area, that's where I came up. Um, that's where I, I lived until I left um, the city and moved down to Prince George's County. But, um, yeah, it was just. My sister school. lived out your way. I used to play ball at Scott's Branch. Okay, yeah, my sister went to Scott's Branch. I was too old. My sister, she uh, went to Scott's Branch uh, Elementary. I was already, we was in, when we moved over there, I was already in middle school with the old courts. See, I was the reverse. When I would I would leave the city to come out there on the weekends to pretty much escape the city. Wow, wow, yeah. Y'all yeah. got deer, bun deers, bunny, rabbit, and foxes. We had... How about that? Rats. Triggers, rats, and roaches. <laughs> right, right, right. But you now... That whole corridor is almost just like, you know, after was it Kurt Schmoke kicked everybody out the city. They sent them right on out there with Long Randallstown, Mill for Mill area. So it was like, hey, it's, it's different now. What's that place? King's Court? King's Estate? Oh, um, I know what you're talking about. Um, Where the rich black people live at. Oh, I don't even remember the name of it now. A little further out of uh, Liberty Road. Yeah. Out there by the auto dealership. Yeah, it was Carriage Hill was the apartments. But oh, I know you. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. But I think it is Kings Estate. I think that's the name of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well what happened? Them were drug dealers, weren't they? <laughs> oh, I, don't <laughs> I don't even know. Baltimore City and Baltimore County have a very tight relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. I remember telling what was the name Vicky Armin. She was like, "We don't want the county." To be like the city. I'm like, hold up, all the drug dealers live out your way. Yeah, yeah. There's no separating the two. There's no separating the two. That's it's why one of the same. People from Baltimore, when you leave, and people, I mean, people from the county, when we go tell people where we're from, we say Baltimore. Then you got to specify when you're home, like Baltimore City versus Baltimore County. Well, everybody else is Baltimore. Like we so, are so, all the so same. 
how did that work down in Hampton? I want to know when did you start getting called? Because at some point, somebody they gonna call you be more. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was always so. It was always be more. Um, so I had um, you probably know Jason Morgan. He a lot of people know Jason Morgan in Baltimore. We were we graduated Hampton together. So it was me, him, uh, the promoter. A dude. Yep. Well, he, yep. he was a promoter. Yeah, he's got the um. Oh man, I wish I could remember the name of it, but he, he's got his spices that he does right now and everything. He does a lot of stuff. Good dude, good dude. But um, him, there's a couple other guys, Ajane, who used to work for the NAACP for a while. We were like the three Baltimore club dudes. So we'd go down to uh Hampton at all the parties. Once that club music started playing, you know, they knew it. We would be more. Cause we was in the, we were the ones, you know, taking over the party once they started playing. Back then it was only they only played like the percolator and you know, a couple songs back then. But um, that was it. So people knew. Baltimore, uh, but that's the thing though. It's like even now, like when I moved to Prince George's County, when I would tell people I'm from Baltimore, and this is post wire, they automatically think, okay, you from where, where they make the wire. And I'm like, eh, no, not that part of Baltimore, <laughs> you know, <laughs> gotta be specific. But do but, they yeah, take a step back from you? Definitely get respect. And I was, when I was doing substitute teaching for a while, I was like, I let them believe that I'm from Baltimore. They're like, oh, I was like, yeah, yeah, Baltimore, right? I had to tell them the secret, but. Yeah, so people really, uh, that, and that was the thing too, because like I didn't watch the the wire when it was live, uh, when it was when, when it was airing, um, but I didn't have cable. I wasn't nothing against the show; I just didn't have cable. But um, <laughs> you know, but learn like seeing My how my sister had cable. That's why I came out to the county. See, see, there you go. And I we ain't have it, so I ain't watch it. By then, I was I think I was on my own by then. But that's why I, I didn't watch it. But I saw how people started to shift how they look at Baltimore. Like when you say you from Baltimore, you know, people outside of the city. Yeah. They're like, Oh, hold on. Like, oh, chill, chill, chill. You know, Baltimore is more than the wire, but it um, is yeah. man. And you know, I'm insulted yeah. when people say that because given if you really knew the black history and then mm -hmm. you're going to let mm -hmm. David Simon come in here and tell us, Oh, y'all are, y'all are some terrifying black people. Like, hold up, pimp. Go sit down. Yeah. You got one yeah. piece of the story that you have exploited, you know, it was entertaining and all of that. You yeah. think of the wire, the corner, you know, yeah. and, and it was all, it was all great. It was good stuff. But I think that, um, I wish somebody yeah. black would have wrote it personally. People went, yeah, yeah. And I, and, and I'm gonna be honest with the city too. Like, I think that at some point too many people in the city started trying to take on that persona too. I think, I don't think it was as bad as it was when the wire came out. But I think once the wire aired, it seemed like the city started, people started, oh, I got to be like, started it. yeah, I got to be, I got to be like, you know, uh, I can't remember the name, people's names now. But yeah, Marlo, so, that was them. Marlo yeah. had a shotgun. It got Marlo. Yeah. So people wanted to be like that. And it felt like, okay, is this really who we are? Or you know, really some, some people, to... you're right. A segment, they are mm -hmm. like that. They will be like that. Their grandmothers was like that. Their grandmothers had shotguns. But not the rest of these people. That's the thing. That's the thing. And most of the ones who were like that, it was are cold. dead or locked up. They, and, and people, you know, they they kept to themselves and only dealt with the people who was dealing with, you know, in their business. Yes. You know, now, now you got it wasn't everybody thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that that was uh, I don't even remember what the question, how we even got onto the wire, bro. Well, <laughs> but yeah, the, it's when, Baltimore. When when you were at Hampton, yes. you know, how did people perceive you? Yeah. I mean, when yeah. I was in Atlanta, oh, you from B more, and it took a minute for me to gather mm -hmm. where Baltimoreans fit in the national scope of things. Yeah. And and to put it plainly, we're leaders. We're yeah. national leaders. Yeah. And, and, and I if think, you were uh, from New York, you better be thorough, because I was I was gonna have a problem with you if you weren't thorough. Don't yeah. be telling me you're from New York and you really from, you know, uh, upstate. Hampstead. Don't tell yeah, don't <laughs> tell me you're from the city because I'm going to ask you what borough. You from Brooklyn? Yeah. Boogie Down? How? That was another thing about Hampton, man. Being in college is like, especially New York. Them New York cats, see. And at that time when I was in school, New York had the reputation more than Baltimore did as the thug. So it was like, they come it down depends. there trying. It depends. Well, I, I mean, in my circle, like for them, I mean, when you get this, oh, you from New York? Oh, oh. but it's like yeah, at some well, point you gotta be like, listen, back. we gonna pull back your curtain. Like, hold up, all right, we all sitting here in college. Like, I don't care where you from. You ain't no thug. You in college? That's Thugs right. don't go to college. <laughs> Not right. Hampton University of all schools. So it's, yeah, 
you know, tell me good. about the legacy of Hampton and what it means to you. Man, okay. So Hampton Just University. Doug Burnett, we better shout. You can't mention Hampton and not mention Doug Burnett. So I, I I know he watching. I don't want to catch no stuff from your, your homeboy. Shout out, shout out, Derek. So yeah, Hampton, uh, man, for me, when I came out of high school, honestly, I was um it was only I, I was first college um, graduate in my family. So there was no one guiding me and leading me on how to do this thing. It was just my circle of friends who were going to college. So I knew in high school I started applying for college. I was dating a girl. Well, actually, so I was going to Howard because at that time it was uh, HBCUs are big. Um, I knew about Howard because it was here. It was close. Howard and Morgan were the options. Uh, Morgan lost my application. Once I visited Howard's campus, I was like, I'm not going to school in this city like this. So I was um, dating a girl who was going to ha uh, Hampton. So she went down. There. I went down there for a high school day, visited it's a peninsula. If anybody's never been to the campus, you 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 want to talk about old like suburb? If you talking about <laughs> think about uh, just the most beautiful, pristine campus on water. Like you, you, every day, you're on the waterfront, and I just fell in love with the school, man. I fell in love with the 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 camaraderie. The, the our motto was: we don't shake hands, we hug. So can you imagine just every day, just filling your life with hugs from people, right? Like that that energy just goes through you. So. It was the first place where I felt like everybody around me was excellent, you know, and I, I mean, who looked like me. So it was like you just surrounded by that excellence, the history of the school and, and how it was founded. You know, um, most HBCUs were founded by, uh, you know, so, uh, non-blacks. Um, so yeah, white just, people, I was shocked to find out that Morehouse yeah. was, my school was founded yep. by an old white man or Spellman, yep. the, the, the Rockefellers and the all Rockefellers. that. Yep. 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 I learned that. On you the start tour. to from yep. what you think you know from what you really know. Yep, yep. Yeah, it was kind of, you, you know, yeah. alarming. Yeah, oh yeah, that, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, sometimes you don't want to dig too deep because you're like, if I find out something, I don't, I don't necessarily want to know, <laughs> you know. But you know, Hampton was just one of them places where it's like, every time, even now, 30, 25, 27 years I graduated, 26 years I've been out of school. So even now, like every time I go back, it's just still like when you're there, it's like it's your home. It's like we're that's the land I was made. Like that's where I was made. That's where I was formed. That's where everything that um you know uh made me relate, a man right. was started, man. So it was like, yeah, absolutely. And and that HBCU, we get to the HBCU versus PWI thing, but that, that my HBCU experience for me, I speak for me, was was the best thing that could ever happen for me. So man, we had Spellman across the street. What you talking about? It was no problem. The only man, problem I, was the money. That's where you find out about the money. Right, right, right. If I didn't go to, about the money. Yeah, if I didn't go to Hampton, like Morehouse was definitely like I, I could have done Morehouse. Um, not understanding that Spellman when I was coming out, I didn't realize Spellman was right next to him. I'm like, I ain't going to all boys school. But yeah, Morehouse is definitely uh the classes school. over there. Well, I know now, like I know now, like, oh, they shared campus and take classes again, everything. They they didn't do a good job telling us that back in 1993. <laughs> I had a counselor named Miss uh Lillian Gundy at Dunbar, probably two years in Dunbar. And she said, You look like a Morehouse man. man I've never cool. forgotten that. I was what 17 years old. I've never then we had a counselor who actually went to Morehouse. And this was coming out of Dunbar the same year with Muggs and Reggie Williams. And I will mm -hmm. tell you that their athletic excellence, I think, primed everybody else for their own for our own individual excellence. Like, well, mm -hmm. those guys are really good at shooting basketball. I'm going to be really good at what I do, just like what you said Absolutely. earlier. Nice. That, that nice. self identification, that that self confidence. Yeah. And, yeah, that and when you you it just that self confidence got a chance yeah. to breathe and grow and it's where nurtured, right you nurture where we might not have been able to do that as easily if we went to Morgan and stayed on the bridge half of the day. Yeah, man. I mean, that's the reason. One another reason why I wanted to get away from Baltimore didn't go to Morgan because you know back then ninety three Baltimore was the uh, was the the uh, teen pregnancy capital of the world and everything. I was like, I got to get out of here. So I'm going to mess around and have two, three babies before I even get a degree. So, but yeah, man, when, it, when you, that HBCU experience where just four years, five, six years for some of nothing but people telling you, yes, you can, like you can do it as opposed to 
what we get in the regular world every day someone something's telling you why you can't achieve something so i think that that um that that foundation just makes us different man it just makes us different gives us that that uh that confidence and that assuredness in ourselves that we can do it we can do whatever we need to do and 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 that heart to give back and pull people along with us and help them and push them up pull some people are gonna pull some people are gonna push whatever it may be but uh you know i think that that's part of hbcu experience as well born to be dope how did you you know now, now i just gotta tell you right i just gotta keep it 100 there was a time when i was sniffing dope i'm just gonna be honest with you <laughs> and, and it took a while for me to wrap my brain around dope meaning anything else but dope right right but right I've I've watched your title this this effort here for years, and that's been over twenty years ago. But I've watched your campaign, your marketing campaign, "Born to Be Dope." What does that mean to you? And 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 I just got to tell you, if you didn't know, Baltimore is a heroin town versus like a DC or yeah, some other cities. Heroin yep. is is really prevalent here, and really at the root of the corner, the wire. That's what separates. But I mean. I live two blocks from Pennsylvania Avenue where they sell probably more dope than Afghanistan. Jeez. And I just saw so how do you involved. take something negative and flip it into a whole industry? Because now, I mean, I can't wait to get my T-shirt. Yeah, you got man, I, yeah, I do. Got T-shirts, uh, hoodies, everything. So um, I wish... I could I'll put I'll put it this way. For me, the word dope never had a, a drug, drug affiliation to it. Yeah, drug connotation. It was always the hip hop that's dope. And that's one of the they always talk about how you age yourself by the slang that you never let go of. Dope is one of the words that I just never I don't care how old I get, I've always used dope. So uh the, the slang. So <laughs> I got but, you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If anybody else watching. So <laughs> But and it was like once I um so for my for me when I when I when when God gave me born to be dope and I was like this is what it's running with I knew what it meant I knew what it meant I was clear with it and this thing, this is a good um uh, um uh, tip for entrepreneurs so for me I was like this is what it is why why you need target marketing and things like that because for me I understood it it meant one thing to me I was cool and and even people in my circle most people understood born to be dope because of the visuals that went along with it and the story they understood what it meant and they had the hip hop connotation to it however to the t-shirts when i first started selling the t-shirts i was using an online site to print the t-shirts as people ordered them and they wouldn't approve the born to be dope for the kids and i'm like well i couldn't make kids shirts because um, a lot of stuff is done by computer. A lot of stuff is done by non-black folk who don't understand the culture. So for them, dope is dope. It's the drugs. It's the heroin. So they're like, well, you can't put, you know, I think they saw it as being a drug thing. We're not going to promote that to kids. That's the first time that I was like, oh, wait a minute. What did I do here? <laughs> you know, like. Uh -huh. what, what a moment. Yeah, exactly. Whereas, you know, had I. Um, kind of flesh that out i would got i would have known that earlier on people said well did you think about this connotation to it and been able to handle that i disagree um, so, Ryan. you had to go with what you were given no no i was going to do it but i'm saying i would have known okay people may see it this way so then i know okay well how can i make sure that when people see it they don't kind of take you know there's nothing you can drugs. do about that yeah well that's that's it so and that that's where i'm getting to so i'm like you know what if, if, you rebranded you rebranded something negative I, I, i'm here I, to tell you i know about I that other that. side you rebranded something negative into something positive I, I, I kind of like hip-hop now i ain't gonna go so far yeah. with the n-word or the b-word yeah. but hip-hop yeah. is is about redefining ourselves right, in right. in the midst of this belly of the beast taking ownership of the word and, and we're going to use it for how we want it. Yeah. I agree with you on that one. So yeah. And that, that's where it was. I'm like, and, and it's, it's hit, like it's resonated. It's been, you know, as a speaker and an author, like I've written, um, I'm working on my eighth book now, but I've been a part of uh, 11 books. Um, my, my course and most, all of my books have always been about my journey first. So it was like, okay, it got to the point now. It's like, what is my, my overall, uh, my overarching 
theme, my mission, my goal that combines everything, my whole entire journey. How does it culminate? And it, it was born to be dope. You look at all of my, my journey from successes in your hand about finding your purpose, from create a better you about overcoming obstacles in, in your comeback to becoming a passionpreneur to really, you know, making money, doing what you love. It's all about being dope. It's all about just accepting you for who you are. Um, you know, you're an officer, you know, uh, I'll ask you, I know this is your show. I'm going to interview you, ask you one question. When you do, <laughs> when you did your book covers, how long did you had to go through the, and, and probably not you, because I know you, Donnie, but like, did you have to ask yourself, do I put my black face on my book cover or do I hide myself so that people don't know this is by a black man? Because that was a real conversation I had to have myself when I was coming up, like my, my first book, do I put my face on this or do I want to appeal to everybody else? So that kind of started to resonate with me. Why am I, I why are we the only ones had to worry about can my website be too black? Uh can 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 my marketing be is it too black? How do I appeal to everybody else? Like, you know what? No, I'm me, I'm dope, and whoever's gonna accept me for who I am, but you know, if, if white people can't accept, I would say non-black because it's more than just white. If non-blacks can't accept my black face, they ain't for me. And I have to be cool with that and accept that and, and stop trying to appeal to those people who aren't even my market and make sure that and, and being dope means that I'm going to understand who I am. No, I ain't look. I don't wear suits and ties when I go out and speak no more, you know, because I was trying to look like everybody else. I'm going to wear what I want to wear. And that's why I thought another reason why I started the brand, because, you know, people will forgive you if you wear your brand. Like if I wear a T-shirt, it's one thing. But if I wear a Born to be Dope branded T-shirt from a company that I own. Now it's a little different, right? So those are just little things. Like if you want, if you don't want to wear a suit, design your own clothing line, right? Bring your own thing. So those are the kind of things that I was just like, um, now, how do we just, I'm this is me. I'm tired of putting on airs. I'm tired of trying to fit in. I am who I am. And I know there are people out there who can resonate with this and they will. They just got to find me in my authentic self. When I started Be More News 22 years ago, Black people said, oh, that title is ghetto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> B-more news. There was nothing B-more. Where did we get it from? Back in college. Because they would call us folk from Baltimore B-more. Mm -hmm. And, and B-more mm -hmm. became something that I really accepted when I got down to Georgia. But then I right. met this young brother named, I guess he's about your age. You're 10 years younger than me, I think. You're like 48? Yeah, 48, exactly. Yep. I'm 58. So his name's a team. A team with the city. And he had this T-shirt brand called Be More. Mm. And he broke the acronym down into being more optimistic and righteously endowed. Oh, wow. And he, he ran that T-shirt for a couple of years. And then he's transitioned to do some other things. He kind of came back to it. But that Be More T-shirt and, and that acronym just inspired me even more to go with the brand Be More News. And all of that to say, 21 years later, you got be more dog, be more lifestyle, be more television show, be more magazines, be more everywhere. But back then, my critics, black people, yep. that that name is too ghetto. Now, all, all of these people running to be associated with be more this, be more that. And, and it kind of made me think of Jay-Z where he said, I started, I'll start another trend. So when, when God put that brand into you, be more dope. You had no choice but to ride with it. And yeah. you'll figure it out along the way that that's what he gave you to run yep. with. And again, Absolutely. you rebranded something. Now you know Baltimore is a, is a heroin town. Now they got the fentanyl. The fentanyl yep. come from China. Don't even get me <laughs> into the, the drug history, but you took a negative and you flipped it in my world and you made that word safe again wow. for for. for those of us who may have gone down some some bad roads. Awesome, man. Uh, that, that that that's very humbling. I appreciate you even sharing that with me, man. Because and, and that's I tell people all the time, like you never know who's watching you, who's being positively impacted by you. I know as someone on a um, as an entrepreneur, as someone who has goals, like we sometimes we get so focused on the goal that the 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 journey we 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 miss all the gems we're dropping all the lives we're changing all the people we're touching on the journey because we haven't hit the goal yet so it's like yo my goal was you know here but i'm only hitting here 
So I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking like, oh, it's not as successful as I wanted to be. But I started down here. So all these people that I impacted here, they may not, may or may not have let me know, those people are watching you. Those people are seeing you. So it was like your journey isn't just for you. You know, uh, so I tell people all the time, you know, go out and do you because, you know, I had no idea that I was, you know, when I <laughs> came up with this, it would be, you know, have the kind of impact on somebody like you um, as well. So I tell people, just do it. You just don't know who's out there. I, I tell you what else impacted me, Ryan, your consistency. Mm, yeah. When, like when this, you've man. been doing something a long time, you tend to notice the people over there in lane three. Damn, he's been out there a good 15 years. And then you know, people that are all the way down there in lane 87. But damn, she's been doing it a long time too. You tend to yeah. notice the people who, yeah. who within their annual cycle, whether it's in the in the spring, the summer, the fall, you know they coming with a half foot of uh, mm -hmm. half court. All that year. You know they're gonna just. You know yeah. they're gonna. You know they're gonna hit something. Uh, you know, and that man, that's so deep because that's again, like when you just going through it, you don't think about it. Every now and then, I sit there like, man, I have been doing this for a while, right? Like I was with yeah, you at your months, uh, man. What 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 uh anniversary was that you had that I was I came to? I think it was at least ten to twelve years ago. So it might be your fifteenth anniversary. I don't know what it was, but yeah, it's like. But again. Because my and this is one of my my own weaknesses. Because my 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 vision and my paper, my 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 plan says one thing. I'm just constantly I'm going 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 going. I don't take time to stop and smell the roses, uh, nurture those relationships, appreciate. You're, you're learning the journey. too. Yeah, you're right. I am now. Right, I, I'm learning now because like I look back, like man, I've been doing this. Because I look well, originally, it'll be like I've been doing this for X amount of years, and I ain't got this 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 this. But no, I was like, like wow. you said early on, don't compare yourself. Right. Exactly. These are lessons you learn along the way. And now it's like, OK, yeah. And again, it's kind of that's where it all goes back into Born to be Dope, because this is like you got to um, appreciate who you are, appreciate your journey. And your journey is is yours. And it still has value to those who who, who you're impacting. So, look, I, I need to take over this interview for a minute. I need to take the, <laughs> take the realm back for they say you know you have the Holy Spirit when you help empower others. Mm. At what point, and you, you've you've spoken to this over the past few minutes, at what point did you realize that it wasn't just about Ryan C. Green? That at what point did you start getting high off of helping others? Oh, that's a great question. Um I'm, I, I can where, go to a started, moment where, where that started feeding your soul in the most positive of ways. I mean, because I would imagine as as much as you thought it was about you scoring you, you know, hitting the big house and all of these things. Yeah. Somewhere along the line, you 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 saw where the man who gets the most assists is just as important as as Steph Curry. Yeah, I think when I um, started my personal development journey. I think uh, it was 1999, I think. No, it was 2001. It's 2001 when I started a um, network marketing company. And that's when I first started uh, personal development and just starting to read books on leadership and read books about um, servant leadership and, and purpose and just helping others. And that's kind of where it was already in me. Like, that's how I was built. But I couldn't put it in words. I couldn't like, kind of say what it was. So. When I wrote my first book, Success is in Your Hand, it was really a book about helping people who I wanted to give them what I wish someone had given me. So my very first book was all about how to help people who weren't in person, who, who weren't exposed to personal development like I was get what I got. But I wanted them to get it in a way that was they, they could reach it. They could attain it because, you know, I I could have written books with you know five dollar words, as they say, you know, and, and all these big and made myself look all high and mighty and, and great but my thing has always been how can i take complex issues complex ideas uh spiritual ideas and just break them down real simple so that anybody can get them right so my thing was i wanted to appeal to people who were just like me 
but just didn't know, didn't have access to the information. But if you gave them the information, they would know what to do with it and run with it. And that was it. So my first book, all, it, it came from, because I was in a dark, I was in a bad place. Like when I wrote a book, Success in Your Hand, like I was facing foreclosures and repossessions. Like how am I writing about success? Because God told me to, because he gave me the book and he said, right, right, right. Be man, there. Man, man, look, look, we got, we got, a few minutes left, and now you finally gonna mention God, man. You better give oh, God his, man, oh, man. his or her. I mentioned him earlier. Yeah, but everything. Look, every, but that's my thing. Everything in my life. My, my dad was a pastor. Okay, so uh, I tell my mom. Oh, now it comes dad, out. You no, know, my dad Pat, was a pastor. Like my, I, ra I was raised by my mama in a single mother home, but my dad was there. Like he was part of my so life. So you still a PK? Yeah, so I'm still a PK. I went to his church and everything for, for quite a few years. So I'm still a PK. So it was always a So you know the whole Bible, Genesis, all nah, the way to I Revelation. Saying, nah, I ain't saying all that, Donnie. <laughs> me those I ain't saying all that, Donnie. But my <laughs> but um it was just all you know, my thing was always how can we reach people where they are, you know, and, and give them more. I want to be able to take take the Bible into the business world. That was my first inspiration. How can I take the Bible? into the business world without preaching because the business world corporate america ain't calling them pastors to come talk to the salespeople. but how can i take a biblical principle flip it and to make it look business like without you know them thinking oh he's gonna hear talking about jesus so that was really how it all started so i guess you know i've never looked at it that way till you asked me this question it's like that was it was always there it was always about giving back it was always about helping other people because there's other things i could have done that would have made me a whole lot more money a whole lot faster you know, but it wouldn't help nobody it would, uh, but me, you know, so that's really a kind of where, you know, it all came from. Where is Randall's town today? What do you mean as far as socially or like? Yeah, what, socially, what culturally, Randall? is this still know. the place? I mean, we've been, you know, Randall's town is the result of integration in many ways. We've been going mm -hmm. out the Liberty Road corridor since the 70s. I yeah. mean, because prior to that, we couldn't, you know, often live beyond North Avenue on the north side, right. Fulton on the west. We we were Baltimore was the most segregated. Yeah. You know, this is the home of segregation. We weren't yeah, out the Liberty yeah. Road corridor. That's a, a new phenomenon. You got now you got political leaders out there. I'm sure you've heard of Ken Oliver, Dolores yeah. Kelly, Ella, Ella White yeah. Campbell. That's, That's a whole cool. movement out that Liberty Road corridor. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I was on the yearbook staff when I was in Milford, and I looked at the Milford high, I mean, yearbooks from the 40s and 50s, and there was no black people in there at all. So I know at that you know, we all kind of pushed our way out there. I don't know, but like, I, I don't spend a lot of time out there at all now. Most of my people that I knew have grown and moved other places. So I just know when I go, really? it's still home, though. Like, yeah, like when I go out there, like, I'll, I'll, if I'm through there, I'll go and drive by the old, um, you know, my, my, my neighborhood next to Hillcrest where I grew up, but nobody's there. Like none of the people that I, they, they're all grown. They seem to live around like, um, homeless mills, you know, people from around, we moved out to Milford and Randallstown. Then we moved to Owens mills. Yeah. Cause, then, cause, then cause, then we moved cause, to Newtown and Rice's town. <laughs> so, cause, cause more poor black people start making their way out there. I remember my brother right. lived on Lucerne and yeah. he had a neighbor move next door to him. My brother took, immaculate care of his lawn mm -hmm. but he had a black man move next door to him who poured concrete on the lawn oh my no God. more grass Jeez. and he said i'm going to, i'm going to marriottsville road and then the next stop is pennsylvania yeah i'm about to say where do y'all go after they left righteous town but i think you're right pennsylvania they all your, york, york pa <laughs> your pennsylvania yep <laughs> so yeah i don't know i mean so like they still classism a, a new classism mm -hmm. A new class of black people, you know, who, who yeah. want to leave the poor yeah. and, and really the poor yeah. mentality, the ghetto mentality. Yeah. And then you get out there to the schools. Let me just tell you, I saw them black kids at Newtown mm -hmm. when they first built Newtown. I saw people yeah. destroying Newtown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a yeah. lot of people, but just that that miscreant element. Mm -hmm. that yeah, hood yeah. thing yeah. whatever it was yeah well shoot i'm down here in mitchellville maryland now <clears throat> prince george's county the richest predominantly black county in the country y'all got ghettos and no that's my that's where i'm going i'm like it, you're talking it, about it, they, they 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 don't leave they just put a fence around they, they put a gate around the community and think that they they're good now you know but it's like no we 
Prince George's the only the only school system in the state of Maryland that's below performs worse than Prince George's County is Baltimore City. So it's like how you got the I richest. I think Baltimore City is a step above them. I'm sorry. You think they passed them? I wait, wait for the numbers to come out, Donnie. I don't know. But well, uh, the next for the bottom. That's your that's, point. That's, and that's point. where, to right. me, a governor yes. Moore should have a task force. First black yeah. governor, a Baltimore Prince George's, a Prince George's Baltimore task force to reverse this insidious yeah. trend. Right, right. Why Baltimore and PG at the bottom? Right, because if you say if there's money, well, you got the poorest city and the richest city. But both predominantly black, both at the bottom. So what is it? Does anybody so, see the correlation besides right, exactly. you and I? Hey, so I ran for office down here a couple of years ago, and that's when I started really understanding different. Oh yeah, I ran for county council down here, um, and uh, that's when I realized. You should have called me. I got a phone book. People are different down here. It, it, the people are different down here. When you talk about that classism, man, it's, it's a difference. You should give me a call. <laughs> I ain't doing it no more. Why? I nah, I, I'm gonna impact people other ways. I nah, I it's don't want to game. Like it, it that's the thing, and I, I'm not built like that to deal with. You from Baltimore, people. man? You down at PG? You know. Come on, man! I'm telling you, you got you you got something. You got a little Bud Spencer, and you they don't know about. See, that's the thing about me. I'm like, uh, I'm not, I'm not cow tailing, and I'm not going, you know, sell my soul for nobody. So it's like y'all gonna have some hurt feelings, or some people gonna, you know, I don't know. It was just, it was, it was different, man. It was. My I saw I saw just a little bit behind the curtain. I was like, oh, that's how the game is played. So oh, they sell, I'm like, they'll sell their soul, their mama, their yeah, baby, yeah. their future. Yeah. So I was like, let me just find some but, other. But way I gotta that tell you, if you down that way, you gotta know that Marion Barry is like uh an all important Woo! figure to oh, yeah. Prince George. If it weren't for Marion Barry, if it weren't and you just lost the giant, Tommy Broadwater. Yeah, I saw that. The first yep. black state senator, uh, Wayne Curry, the first black yeah. county executive. These people, and because of their sacrifices, they opened doors that no one could open. Right. If yep. you ever rethink that, let me know because it'll be different this time. I promise you. All right. I, I, I'll let you. I'll definitely you'll be the first person I call. And then you can always influence others. Yeah, like I said, I, I'm a, I, I'll help. I'll help other people's campaigns. I might do something right now. I'm like, let me focus on building my thing, so I can, so I can be, you know, you know helping you know, in that way. The so first we'll place I went to as an adult in Prince George's was Woodmore, and I've been in love ever since. Yeah, that's that's right where I am. I mean, I, I'm outside of Woodmore. Mitchellville is right before, right, right next to it. So yeah, yeah. I love Woodmore. One of the most. I mean, to go to a place and see black people. You know, on on a golf course, million dollar yeah. homes, some of the most beautiful homes ever, man. Big ups to Will yeah. Hobson for taking me down there to let me see some of that good stuff. Yeah, it definitely opened your mind up and see how things can be. But like I said, it's also they ain't they ain't really like they more like this. They ain't really like this. You know, it, I mean, let me camera. They more they more like this is mine. They, they, well, let me not let me not generalize and, and over characterize. No, I don't no, but, nobody, but, but Baltimore got some stingy black people. Yeah. We got a black governor, a black mayor, a black comptroller, yeah, a, a black treasurer, a black speaker of the house. What do these positions mean? See, there there were people who fought for us to be able to get these positions, not for yeah. us just to get these positions, but for us to get these positions and help empower others like you've done with Born to yeah. Be Dope. And yeah, so when, yeah. when black people in particular don't understand that, then sometimes you got to, you know, you got to grab them by the collar. <laughs> that's right, say, that's right. Yes. You got to take them out back and have a little conversation with them. Did you forget? Yep. Did you really exactly. think Barack Obama that this was just about you? Right. Yep. Did you really? I'm with you. I'm with you, man. I'm with you on that one. So it's a lot of work to do. I'm, I'm with you, man. I didn't mean to get so passionate, but then again, you you put passionpreneur. I, tell me a little bit about. So, who is the writer? Who in your family do you think you got the gift of writing from? I don't know. Like no one that my family's small, man, and and, and all of them are gone. So if, I can't if, you got your, to if you so got to, you the, you the preacher kid. So, Happy my dad. Like having my dad. Like that's the thing. Like when your mom. A, she read my mom read a lot she didn't really write but my dad was a pastor so he's writing sermons every single week so maybe that's where it came from i don't know but you but, gotta uh, read in order to be able to write yeah 
Yeah, I mean, that's maybe I got a combination of both of them. I got a little bit of both, but I, mom, I can't. Mom, don't, right hey, mom's now. got you now. Don't forget, we oh, yeah. come from moms now. Oh yeah, oh yeah. My mom's so, wrote I mean, my. She typed up my first book of poems. Nice, nice, nice. What a memory. Yeah. That was another inspiration. My mom, she passed away when she was 51. Uh, that was another part of my inspiration. Because my first book hadn't even been done by then. I didn't write my first book before she passed away. But that was a lot of motivation, too. She was 55. Yeah. So, like, seeing her uh, work her whole life for the government, and all she wanted to do was retire. And I'm like, you didn't even get a chance to do that. That kind of pushed me to motivate me to say, listen, I, I can't. That just reinstilled the fact that I wasn't going to work for nobody else forever. And I had to go out there and really do my thing. So, uh, you know, she definitely motivated me in that way. She's with you and she's smiling on you, Ryan. You got how many Absolutely. books out? Uh, seven. Seven out. I'm working on Born to be Dope is going to be a book. So I just got to work that. That's coming out in 2024. And you work on movies too? Year. Don't you got a movie coming out? Yeah. So I do the Born to be Dope as a visual mixtape. So it's a film that's coming out as well. I already did the first one. So the second one's coming out soon. Uh, Born to be Dope. That's the thing. Like it's a film. It's a summit. It's a clothing line. It'll be a book soon. It's also a podcast. So I do podcasts. Uh, you can get that any podcast uh, provider you go to uh, on YouTube as well. So I mean, Born to be Dope is more than just, you know, a, a cool slogan. Like it's a whole thing to it, man. It's a whole brand, whole movement. We we done went way over, but I got to ask you the most important question. All right. Who is your top mentee? Top mentee. I like that. Mentee. Um, Who right would you now, pass the ball to? Who would you say? Yeah. That's that's right one now, of my superstars. Yeah. Um, that I have a lot of clients that I've mentored, and um, but the one that the people I'm pouring into right now really are my son and my nephew. Uh my son will be 21 in uh November. My nephew just started college and just nah, both of them, you can't be family. Family don't count. Nephew, oh, I'm like they're both of them in media. That's what I'm saying. They're they're both. And they're, they're walking in my path. And, I'm saying, I'm, and, so let me think. Let me think. That's a tough one. Who do I? Man. You may not have seen. You've been doing this 20, 30 years. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like, somebody I can, I who's been shooting threes and you know. Yeah, because see, see, in my background, a lot of what I used to do was the books and authors. A lot of authors out there, a lot of speakers who, who I've mentored, but I've transitioned myself. So I don't necessarily um, connect they with them on a regular children, basis. Man. Right. The, my point is, they're not at the top of the mind for me. Like, oh yeah, I can call them. Boom, 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 boom. That's my thing. So, look, I got seeds out there everywhere. I got, well, they, they, they trees now. I got people out there. Well, you had to ask them. If I mentored you, let me know. You've <laughs> in the chat that I was your mentor. I know how to impact somebody's life out here, Donnie. Man, you impacted mine, man. Unapologetically black. You know, you. I get, I get to write a book like that because of people like you. Uh, I'll just leave you with the words of uh, Marion Williamson, okay. who talked about our deepest fear. And she says, as you're liberated from your own fears, your presence automatically liberates others. Mm. You ever, you ever mm. hear that? Mm. Our I'm deepest not, fear. I... She said, our deepest fear is not that, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness that most yeah. frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us, not just in some of us, but in all of us. And as you let your own light shine, you unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As you're liberated from your own fear, your presence automatically liberates others. I'm gonna give you a minute to go ahead and do your closing spiel. I know I'm gonna cut you off half the show, and big ups to your wife, because I know that's your, that's your ace by your side. Yeah. We didn't even get to talk about her, but I'm going to make her proud right now. Back. And give you, you a chance. Me back. Huh? That's mean you got to bring me back. Oh, okay. Well, you, I want you to do a plug for yourself, okay? All right. I appreciate this, Donnie. Listen, I'm Ryan C. Green, the passionpreneur. You can follow me at ryancgreen.com. Um, but right now, Born to be Dope. Matter of fact, that's the best way. Go to I am Born to be Dope. Uh, on Instagram, you can follow me there. Follow the podcast anywhere you get podcast streams. Born to be dope. Um, if you are ready to celebrate being unapologetically great at being you, then uh, let's talk. Let's get together. Let's 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 join forces in this uh, thing and really help you reach the levels of of success and fulfillment that you want. I'm Ryan C. Green. 
Go out there, be unapologetically great at being you because you were born to be dope. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, world. <laughs>